Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Cathedral of St. John Berkman. It's great to have you back as we conclude our series today uh, all about the Catholic retrospective. We've done the first 1,500 years of the church. We've talked in terms of the medieval church as well, the bad popes, cry for reform, all about Mount, uh, Martin Luther, all about indulgences, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And now here we are wanting to talk to you about the real reform, the reform that took place within the church, not creating a new church, but a reform that took place within the church. So the Council of Trent, and if you've listened to any of my podcasts, you've heard about those who I have called the real, true reformers, the saints of the church. Anyhow, today we will hear all about the Council of Trent itself, and then uh, from Dr. Cheryl White, and then I will speak to you about the Mass itself. And this will be a great overview of the entire uh, history of the Mass, which I'll try to do in 15 to 20 minutes' time. Anyhow, what I, how I'd like to begin today, I've been beginning all of these with a collect of the Mass from Masses for Christian Unity. But today I'm going to use our collect today that we hear in this Mass, this Sunday, the 31st Sunday of Ordinary Time. It's a collect that goes back to the 6th century, to approximately uh, the 530s. This is in the first known sacramentary. I'm going to talk to you all about the sacramentaries, the early sacramentaries, the Leonine sacramentary, or many people call it the uh, Verona, Veronese sacramentary. But this, if you've already been to Mass, you've heard it, and I uh, use part of it to conclude my homily today. But let's use this right now to begin our gathering this morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Almighty and merciful God, by whose gift your faithful offer you right and praiseworthy service, grant, we pray, that we may hasten without stumbling to receive the things you have promised. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So now we just pray to prayer. People in the church have prayed for 16 centuries. Uh, when I talk to you about the Mass, you're going to find out things that we have been doing since the very beginning. But now, let us just go straight to it. Let's talk about the Council of Trent, Dr. Cheryl White. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so is everyone up to speed uh, from last week? Everyone here last week, and everybody's up to speed about where we were with uh, leading off with Martin Luther, his excommunication, and the church moving forward from that point in time. If you were not, up to speed, then you have an opportunity this Wednesday night at 8, uh, excuse me, 6 p.m. here in the parish hall. I'm going to do a little recap of actually the last two talks. It's going to be the abridged version, okay, but, uh, or you can catch them online. I understand that, that at least um, one of them is already posted. I'm not sure about the last one, but you can catch them online as well. Okay, so as Father Peter mentioned, you know, reform this was something I talked about the first, the first lesson, the first session we had in here for our Catholic retrospective. You remember that the very first day I challenged us all to, to watch our vocabulary, and I challenged us about using the term Protestant movement instead of Protestant Reformation. And one of the reasons for that is because I believe it's a misnomer. Reform is something that happens within an organization. It happens within an institution. It doesn't happen outside of it. So true reform, the true reformers are those who are within the church, who are working within the body of Christ to reform the abuses, to reform the corruptions. As I pointed out, and I think we've seen over the last several weeks, that the church reforms itself in every age. It has done that in every single age and certainly would have in this age as well. So the Council of Trent is often called the Catholic Reformation. Uh, sometimes you'll see textbooks refer to it as the Counter-Reformation. I'm not sure I like that term either. But it is the true Reformation. This is the Reformation of the Church that, that comes because, though, remember, those sort of, um, the, the wheels of reform were already in motion 
before Martin Luther ever registered his protest. If you go back to the 15th century and look at the, the, the councils that were, that were called throughout that century, the reform agenda was a little bit derailed, you'll remember, because there was great preoccupation, at least in the beginning to the mid of the 15th century, with trying to reconcile Eastern and Western Christianity. So there were a lot of efforts that, that failed there, but that was what the church was really driving from the Western uh, side. The reform initiatives were kind of derailed by that. The last council to meet before Trent was Fifth Lateran, um, which met the same year, ironically, 1517. Uh, the session ended in March of 1517. And again, there was reform on the agenda, um, and, and there were reforms at, uh, at Fifth Lateran, but everyone knew that it was going to take a major effort. And conditions in Europe, remember I said this, I think the very first day, you cannot separate the narrative of church history from what's going on geopolitically. What's going on everywhere else in Europe uh, is, is also going to be the background to this. So I want to take just a little bit of time this morning and talk about the lead up to the Council of Trent. Why, what is the delay? If, if Martin Luther has registered his protest and sparked this incredible firestorm of controversy in 1517, why does the first session of the Council of Trent not meet until 1545? I mean, that seems like a long time to wait if, if the church is aware that there is this need. So I wanna talk a little bit about what is going on in Europe, what is delaying this, and it is impossible to do in the time that I have, even if Father Peter yielded me his time this morning, um, it is it, it's impossible to do, to, to get all of this in, but I can hit some of the high points. Suffice it to say that it is an incredibly complex European environment uh, in the 16th century. So many forces of change uh, on every level and, and pressures that secular rulers are under um, th that really impact the church as well. So we're going to talk just a little bit about that at the beginning here this morning. Because if you look at the reactions to Luther's movement across Europe, it is unfortunately very difficult to separate out uh, those religious aspects from the political issues. So we're going to begin uh, by, by sort of looking at what uh, the state of Europe was generally speaking, uh, talk about some of the the monarchies that are, are there involved here. The King of France, uh, who was Francis I, oops, go back. Um, Francis I is on the throne of France. He was ambivalent at first, really, about Luther's movement. He saw within Protestantism uh, some, uh, some validity. He saw that the church needed reform. He was, he was an early uh, one who called for reform and as long as people were outwardly conforming in France, as long as people were going to Mass and they were outwardly conforming, he doesn't seem to have been too concerned about it in the beginning. And as I pointed out before, there's not going to be a lot of Protestants in France in the beginning anyway because of those conditions uh, we talked about last time, going back to, um, to the Gallican Church and the control that the monarchy exercises over his own uh, ecclesiastical affairs. Very unusual for a monarch to be able to do that. He probably was a little bit excited, I think about this sometimes, probably a little bit excited at the challenge that Protestantism posed uh, for his frenemy, um, who was the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. I think that he was a little bit excited probably about, uh, about that, that Charles was having some difficulty in the German provinces and no doubt delighted this particular king. And you'll, you'll see why that is uh, in just a minute. But Francis was a Christian humanist. He was very interested, he's a Renaissance king, very interested in the, the Catholic humanist movement, and he wanted reform from within the church and, and believed that it could happen. And as I said, he does tolerate some of this in the beginning because, and I think we have to keep this historical perspective. These people, these men, these monarchs we're gonna mention briefly, could not conceive of a divided church. Not in 1517. Now, there's one in particular who has no trouble envisioning this in a couple of decades, but um, for the most part, they, they cannot conceive of a, of a divided church. Uh, that, didn't, that didn't make any sense. And Francis believed that Protestants would eventually reconcile. They would come back. They would come back. So, then came October of 1534. Um, 
what is called the Day of the Placards, or the Placard Controversy, Day of the Placards. Parisians entered their churches and found placards had been placed outside of all the major churches uh, in Paris with uh, a, a statement that read this way. True articles on the horrible, great, and insufferable, insufferable abuses of the papal mass. And in about two paragraphs, it's really offensive attack on the mass itself. Um, and this got Francis' attention. Suddenly he is no longer lukewarm about Protestantism. There are, are literally dozens of people rounded up and arrested. Uh, mass executions followed. There is, we have in the social histories, these um, weekly processions of the Blessed Sacrament throughout the streets of Paris, where Francis himself took part in to send the message to his people that this sort of thing was not going to be tolerated. This is about the time, of course, as I mentioned before, that a French lawyer named Jean Calvin, John Calvin decided he would leave. <laughs> he went to Switzerland in the wake of, of this particular event. Okay, so we talked about a little bit about Spain. Um, Spain, on the throne of Spain is Carlos I, uh, who also happens to be the exact same person who is on the throne of the Holy Roman Empire as Charles V. They're the exact same person. So you can see why Francis would be a little bit excited about Protestantism, right? Because this is, this is what we call the Habsburg ring, right? He's surrounded by Habsburgs. In this case, it happens to be the same person. But um, Charles has more trouble, obviously, in the, in the provinces of the Holy Roman Empire than he has in Spain, because as I mentioned before, there's not going to be many Protestants in the land of the Inquisition. The Inquisition is not particularly favorable uh, to Protestants. And so that's not really an issue in Spain, but it is going to be in the Holy Roman Empire for sure. And even in the Holy Roman Empire, though, Charles finds himself in a very difficult political situation. He needs the support of all of those little principalities, particularly the major ones who control the electorate, the electoral college of the, of the empire. He needs their support, particularly because there is a threat in the Mediterranean. The Ottoman Turks. The Ottoman Turks are advancing into Central and Eastern Europe, and, and he needs, obviously needs the military support of these men. Um, in 1526, the Kingdom of Hungary fell, and Charles is aware that, that, and soon after that, the Ottomans attempted to take the city of Vienna. And so there is there's an awareness that he needs the support of these Protestant princes. So, the most interesting reaction, the most ironic reaction to Luther's movement and the Protestant movement actually happens in England. I recognize him. <laughs> really interesting reaction comes from England. St. Thomas More wrote a brilliant, beautiful response to Luther um, that is, of course, well known. And as Lord Chancellor of England, St. Thomas More ordered the confiscation of, of all of Luther's tracts, treatises, anything that mentioned him, and they were all gathered together and burned at St. Paul's Cross in London. Uh, so there, there's this, this very strong uh, legal reaction to Protestantism, uh, but Henry VIII, who in 1521 penned what is arguably still the very best written, most logically argued, point by point refutation of Martin Luther. It's called In Defense of the Seven Sacraments. It earned Henry VIII uh, the title of Fidia Defensor, or Defender of the Faith, from a very grateful Pope Leo X. In 1521, you could not have found a more ardent supporter of the church than Henry VIII. So, it's interesting that um, in his correspondence with Luther, which has survived, it's a little bit entertaining. I'm just going to warn you up front. He calls Luther, addresses Luther in a letter. He addresses him as the vilest of heretics. Okay? To which Luther responds with a letter that is addressed this way. To the dreadful King Hines... By God's disgrace, now king of England. When Luther wrote a tract that defended divorce, Henry wrote a letter reminding Luther, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Oops. What a difference a few years is going to make, right? It's going to make for Henry. 
Uh, Henry's change of heart on marriage that came a few years later uh, complicated actually the calling of a council. This is actually something I think people overlook. It is Henry's quest for an annulment to his, from his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, that actually delayed the calling of the Council of Trent. And the reason for this is that because of the family relationship, Catherine of Aragon is the aunt of the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. He's her nephew. So when he learns that his sweet auntie in London is, is, is in this distress, he takes an army to Rome and surrounds the Vatican with imperial troops. And Clement VII is not going to be, to be granting an annulment. Mm -hmm. And actually ended up sacking the city uh, of Rome. So there is this incredibly complex European environment. That's my point. So yes, the Council of Trent is going to be delayed. The point is, though, that most of Europe, as you can see, saw Luther's movement as dangerous, as destabilizing, uh, to, the, to the political order. And from a purely secular point of view, from a spiritual point of view, these Catholic monarchs uh, saw it as an attack on the church from someone who um, was no true reformer. He was outside of the church. He was no true reformer. So the, um, the interesting thing is that, that when, when Trent finally is called, uh, and you're going to see this, it, it, it takes a very long time. It's three major sessions, 25 sessions in all, but three, um, three callings of the council by three different popes uh, over 18 years. And again, that is reflective of this very complicated uh, political environment. So, but what is also important is that there is a new zeal that is apparent in the church, even, even before the Council of Trent comes into session. There is this obvious kind of palpable uh, zeal. And, and one of the ways, of course, that we are all in our community, of course, familiar with this, is because of this man, St. Ignatius of Loyola, who began the Society of Jesus as a small group of men, actually going back to 1534. It's when they sort of organized and sought um, official recognition by the church as an order, dedicated to the defense of the church, dedicated to the defense of the papacy, uh, did something a little bit uh, non-traditional in that the order, they took the name, uh, Company of Jesus was originally how they called themselves, Company of Jesus, Society of Jesus, uh, rather than, than naming themselves after a person, a human being, which was sort of considered non-traditional, they called themselves the Society of Jesus. And this put some people off, right, um, to do this. So in 1540, however, that Pope Paul III officially recognizes the order but he limits their number. That's something kind of interesting. He restricts them to 60 members, which I think reflects maybe a little bit of, um, of caution about who these men were, what they really wanted to do, what potential the order might have. Again, you have to understand this in the very complex environment that's in the church. But in 1540, Pope Paul III does recognize them we forever associate them, or our historians do, with the Council of Trent because the uh, Society of Jesus was able to send two men to the first session of the Council of Trent as theologians who actually played a significant role there, in, in, particularly in the first session. By the second session, Pope Julius III um, has issued a, a bull that, that expands uh, the Jesuits, allows them to expand, uh, recognizing, as, as the word of that decree says, their significant contributions to the defense of the faith. So they, they explode in, in numbers. They have a really remarkable history, which would be subject for another class, perhaps at another time, to look at this would be a lot of fun. But they had really three major objectives. They sought to reform the church from within through the use of education. Their central focus was always education. By 1548, they'd established their first, their first schools. And, uh, and, and this was always, always their, uh, their focus, if you will. The second was to spread the gospel to the new lands. Remember that the age of exploration and discovery has opened up these, all these new worlds. And so um, there is a focus on, uh, on spreading the gospel to these new lands, to these new peoples. And then uh, finally, of course, as I mentioned before, not necessarily uh, last, but to defend the church. 
and specifically to defend the papacy, to defend the church against Protestantism. So, Pope Paul III, um, who calls the first session of the Council of Trent, he was determined to get a reform, session, a reform council into session. Uh, from the very beginning of his uh, pontificate, he was, was really uh, very zealous about this. He became Pope in 1534. And again, say, so, well, okay, it's nine, it's, it's, it's 11 years. Actually, it's nine years before he calls the council, 11 years before it's going to meet. What takes so long? Well, one of the things that, um, that he was very interested in doing was to really understand the depth of the corruption in the church. He wanted an honest assessment, uh, an objective assessment of what was going on in the church. So he appointed a commission. Uh, to examine that, and they produced a report. Actually, the, 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 count, the commission begins in 1534. This is a little misleading. It's not published in 1534. But they publish a report called Concerning the Reform of the Church. And it really is a, uh, a, a very, I think, balanced document that, uh, that lays out <clears throat> this is what's going on in the church. These are, this, what, this, is what, this is what anecdotal. This is what we can verify. This is what is gossip. You know, so there is this um, this huge report that gets into the hands of Protestants, who then use it as a way of saying, "See, we told you so." The church admits. Look what the church admits they are doing. But but anybody, hopefully, all of us can see the beauty of this is that the church has done the work, the honest work of investigating the claims, has come up with an indictment of itself. And this really pushes uh, the bishops of the church to say, yes, we, we must call this council now. So that's, that's really the impetus for this. In, in this political delays we've talked about, they, they continue to go on, though. I mean, this is always the background particularly with the Ottoman Turks. I mean, that's going on into the end of the 16th century. Uh, that's always going to be an issue. But after uh, a series of being turned down in various cities on the Italian peninsula to hold a council, because Italy has its own problems, it would take a whole other class to talk about, a series of wars going on there, they're turned down to meet several different places. They end up uh, settling on, on the city of Trent in northern Italy in 1545. With these words... Uh, from the Bull of Injunction by Pope Paul III that opened that first session. Whereas we have deemed it necessary that there should be one fold and one shepherd for the Lord's flock in order to maintain the Christian religion in its integrity and to confirm within us the hope of heavenly things and because the unity of the Christian name has been rent and torn asunder by schisms, dissensions, and heresies, we seek a council of reform. 1545, first session of Trent. And as I said, a trend is going to last for 18 years, three sessions. It technically spans the pontificates of five popes, but there are three popes who call these different uh, sessions into order. It is the Catholic Reformation. It is the Reformation of the Church. It is the last major, major reform-oriented council uh, before Second Vatican Council. It is, it is the last uh, of the major reform councils. So... We have Pope Paul III, Julius III, and Pius IV uh, in succession who are, and then ultimately Pius V, who we'll mention at the end briefly. Typically human. We've, this has been a theme we've talked about, right? The church as an organization, as an organism, as Father Peter has pointed out, uh, as a human organism uh, that is typically human when we explore the background, what's going on behind the scenes at the council. Right? The council actually brings together a number of competing human agendas. There are those in the Roman Curia, those who hold office at the highest uh, levels of the church. Uh, many of the, of, the, of the hierarchy are concerned about reform because they don't want it to impact their lifestyle. This is true. They resist any kind of reform initially. Bishops from France have, bring their own agenda. Remember, I mentioned that the Gallican Church in France has enjoyed a lot of autonomy and independence, um, mostly because of uh, Francis I. So they bring an agenda that is they want 
to make sure they don't lose that. They don't lose their autonomy and, and quasi-independence in, in certain affairs. The Jesuits are there standing very firmly, of course, for papal supremacy over, over everything. And some council delegates, like the emperor, Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, well, you can see from what I've told you that he would come with an agenda. He's concerned about the political stability of, of Central Europe. And so um, concerned also, of course, that he's the one who's got the vast number of Protestants. I mean, by, by hands down, he wins in terms of the population of Protestants. He wins. He's got the largest number of them. So he wants Protestants and Catholics to reach a compromise. This is his initial, uh, his initial sort of perspective that he brings to Trent, is he's hoping for that. It's actually under his pressure that the council allowed Protestants to attend the second session uh, of the Council of Trent. Uh, informal talks were held, but when Protestants found out that they were not on the formal agenda to speak and to defend and, uh, and hopefully to, to sway the outcome, they left. They left the council in 1552. Uh, and in a few instances, it, it's reported that some of the delegates came to blows, but that's not unusual. That's happened to councils before, okay? So as to the issue that sparked the Reformation in the church, the light that, the, that Protestants shone on the abuses of indulgences, the council abolished uh, the practice of selling indulgences halted some of the worst abuses of, of that. That was in the last session, actually. And in addition, they, the council passes a number of decrees related to a reform of the morals of the clergy to address behaviors and practices uh, in the clergy. But the council is not only dealing with matters of morality, uh, abuses of practice, but also with doctrine. And and it reaffirms on every single point the traditional Catholic teaching um, and rejected contemporary Protestant thought on every single issue, every single issue, every subject. But to be clear, the decrees from Trent are not framed or worded as negative statements, okay? be very clear about this. I think this is an important point. It's not a mere denunciation of Protestant ideas. It's not, well, the Protestants say this and it's wrong. Or we hereby declare that this teaching of Luther is wrong. Rather, what the council does is, is out of it comes 17 dogmatic decrees. They all are framed as positive statements, as a reaffirmation of the truth. And really that's how it's framed, is a reaffirmation of the truth. There's no defense. There's no, we're saying this because you said that. Okay, if, if, that, if that's helpful. Uh, reaffirming traditional Catholic teaching on every single major point. So, um, through these, these sessions you see uh, exactly what I'm talking about. And again, time does not permit me to really... Uh, go into any of these in any detail, but um, suffice it to say, in the first session, the very first session, uh, the first thing that is done is the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed is affirmed as the basis of the faith. Okay? The very first thing, the Nicene Creed is affirmed as the basis of the Catholic faith. And it's not hard to see why we would start there, right? You know? So that's reaffirmed. The books of the Old and New Testament affirmed as the canon of Scripture in their canonical order, <laughs> right? In their canonical order. Uh, now, there is actually a, um, one denunciation that happens in the, first, uh, in the first session of this council. Um, Sola Scriptura is denounced. Uh, Tradition and scripture are upheld as the means of divine revelation. The Latin Vulgate is affirmed as the only authorized translation of the Holy Scriptures. The number of sacraments is fixed at seven, not three and not two. Again, it's not worded as a defense, as a counter. It's worded as the truth. It's a reaffirmation of the sacraments. 
In the second session, the council affirms transubstantiation. Again, not refuting consubstantiation of Martin Luther or real, uh, or, or real absence of Ulrich Zwingli or any other variation of Eucharistic theology that came out of that Protestant uh, cauldron, right? It's just a reaffirmation of, of this as, as true teaching. Uh, several decrees on the conduct of the clergy, which I've left off, okay, um, should be there somewhere. Several decrees come out of the second and third sessions about the conduct of clergy. Um, the veneration of relics, again, an affirmation uh, of, of this as, as true Catholic teaching. The doctrine of purgatory, again, affirmed as true, there it is, I know it was there somewhere, um, affirmed as true Catholic teaching. Now, the Roman Catechism appeared um, quite soon, actually, after the last session closed. It was promulgated by Pope Pius V, uh, who we don't traditionally associate with having called any of the, the sessions of the council, but he is Pope in the ensuing years. And so um, what began as sort of a compilation of these doctrinal decrees, these 17 dogmatic decrees that came out of Trent, uh, really very quickly expanded into, into the realization that there was a need for a catechism. And interestingly, when we think of catechism, we think of this is, this is a way that we are instructed, right? Lay people are instructed through the catechism. Uh, at Trent, of course, at the closing of Trent, it was realized that it was the clergy who needed education. So the catechism was designed to instruct clergy, not the laity, so that clergy could then properly form the lady. There is this, this understanding that there has been a, a great lapse uh, in education of clergy. So most scholars agree that by the end of the century, by the end of this 17th century, that many of the abuses and corruption that Protestants had sort of shown the light on in many ways um, were on a corrective course, if not already abolished by the end of that century. So as a uh, sort of a segue here, I want to tell you too that one of the things that Pope Pius V did was promulgate a new Roman Missal in 1570 um, in the wake of the Council of Trent. And, and sort of, and I don't, I don't want to step on what Father Peter's going to talk about, um, but just to give you a tiny bit of historical context for that, by Certainly by the beginning of the 16th century, uh, there was um, some variation in the mass from location to location uh, on the eve of the council, which was not always seen incidentally as a bad thing. Um, because, you know, as St. As Athanasius expressed so beautifully at the Council of Nicaea, something I'm always reminded of, is that in order to be truly Catholic, the church really does have to embrace some diversity. And so th that was not necessarily seen as a bad thing, but in the wake of Protestantism, you can understand why this would be important. To not allow Protestant innovations to creep into the mass in some of these areas, uh, there was a need for everyone now more than ever to sort of be, be seen on the same page liturgically. So it becomes a priority in a way perhaps it had not been before. So the result is what has become known as the Roman Missal of Pope Pius V, um, which I think is probably a great segue to Father Peter's talk. Am I right? Is that, are you ready? Okay. <laughs> Do you need the websites? Okay. That was a great uh, segue. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great segue because uh, she speaks about transubstantiation and how many people didn't really truly understand what was meant by that. Uh, the, the need for the clergy to be educated. Because this was a time in which, think about the, uh, where the entire church was at this time. And, and uh, throughout, um, I mean, geographically speaking. And so here you have some people who are in Rome or they're in Great Britain or they're in Southern Spain or they're way in Northern Africa or in uh, Middle East, wh wherever. You know, you, you don't exactly know what each and every single group is doing and how they're saying it or that their interpretation of, uh, of the Latin that is being used at the time. 
So my topic is all about the mass of Trent. And what I am hoping that you are going to see in, in my discussion is that it wasn't as if Trent now compiled a new book and said, here is a new mass that we will now henceforth start to celebrate. And since we have the Gutenberg Press and we can now get it out to all the different parts of, of the world, we will be all on the same page. No. My hope is that you're going to notice that, wait a minute, all of this sounds awfully familiar and goes all the way back to the beginning. So now, of course, my topic is nuanced by the fact that we're looking at this uh, today because we're in the midst of the Catholic retrospective and, and the need for true reform within the church. And as I said uh, at the very beginning, this is a, an unbelievably big topic, but what I would like to do is, is say, what did the Mass look like before Trent? All right, so someone tell me something about the very first Mass. The Last Supper. Okay, the words of institution. In other words, when Jesus said, do this in memory of me, take and eat, take and drink, we're in what language? Aramaic. Aramaic. <laughs> Aramaic. Did you know that right now to this day, uh, th th there are 22 different rites within the Catholic Church. We belong to the Latin rite. All the different rites of the Catholic Church, they have a mass that substantially is the same, but there are significant differences. If you were to go to one of our priests from India, the vast majority of them belong to what is called the Syro Malabar rite. If you go to their mass, expect two, two and a half hours. And as they are chanting in, um, in their native Malayalam, all of a sudden when it gets to the words of institution, they drop into Aramaic. How, I mean, how neat is that? They're, they have done, they want to use the absolute words of Jesus Christ at the time of, um, uh, of the Lord's Supper. After, after we have the Lord's Supper, uh, what is the next language that Mass is celebrated in? Greek. It is predominantly Greek. Why? Well, it was a very Greek-oriented world. After that, it goes to what? Latin. And, and by the way, it's not like this was some big, huge issue back then. It's not like there was some little conflict or huge conflict of, okay, uh, we're now going to decide to go to Latin. It was just a natural thing because, because of the, um, the prominence of, of the Roman um, uh, Empire, the, where the church was, what the people were speaking. So, of course, it goes to Latin. There was no, it was no big issue. Now, uh, Clement of Rome, um, actually, Cheryl, if you don't mind putting it on the other... Oh, there it is. Never mind, I think I can do it. Now, I know Cheryl would say, okay, I need you to use uh, first-hand sources. And I did. <laughs> so, um, okay, so the, in the earliest church, besides what we have in sacred scripture about the institution narrative, take and eat, take and drink. We have Clement of Rome, one of the popes, he dies in the year 99. We also have Saint Justin Martyr, we have Hippolytus, now we're back, now we're in the third century, uh, Novation also third century, but it's Justin Martyr who dies in uh, 165. Uh, he is the one who writes in that first apology, and by the way, this is the 67th um, section of this first apology. He's writing all about the church. He has this great section on baptism. If you were to read that, you'd be like, wow, that, that, that could have been written uh, last week. So a lot of what we do is very much in continuity with, with what goes back, certainly, to the second century. Uh, I like... Justin Martyr and his description. First of all, uh, he's, he's just a very logical um, 
church father. I mean, his approach, he's very well traveled. So what he's talking about is not somehow limited to, to one little specific area. He, he has a great sense of what the church and its universality is doing at the time of the, their most important gathering, the, the liturgy, the Eucharist. Um, he uh, throughout has a, an incredible understanding of sacred scripture. He, he, just, he just tells it like it is. He's forthright, he, he just straight matter to the um, a matter of fact. Um, so many of the early church um, fathers is kind of embellished. They're so, um, anyways, he, he just, he gets straight to the um, issue at hand. So here, um, this is so important. I'm gonna read it to you and I also put it there so that you can read along if you wish. This is what happens on, for their Sunday meeting. And on the day called Sunday, all who live in the cities or in the country gather together to one place and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. Then when the reader has ceased, the president, as in the one who is presiding, verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. Then we all rise together and pray and as we said uh, before said, when our prayer is ended, Bread and wine and water are brought, and the president in like manner offers prayers and thanksgivings according to his ability, and the prayer and the people assent, saying, Amen. And there is a distribution to each, and a participation of that over which thanks has been given. And to those who are absent, a portion is sent by the deacons. And they who are well to do and willing to give what each thinks fit, and willing give what each thinks fit. What is collected is deposited with the president who helps the orphans, widows, and those who through sickness and other cause are in need, and those who are in bonds and the strangers sojourning among us in a word takes care of all who are in need. And then it just talks about Sunday being the, the day of uh, the common assembly. Why? Because it's the same day that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, again, th th this is the mid-second century. It should sound awfully familiar to you. As in, like, yes, unbelievably familiar. Uh, it talks about Sunday. It's the day of the Lord. Remember before, the, the Jewish people were, were celebrating on the Sabbath, Saturday. The day of Saturn. In fact, in the very last paragraph, what, about five sentences up, it speaks about Saturn. Um, the, the day of Sabbath. But our new Sabbath is, is a Sunday. Uh, they gather. They are called together. Ecclesia. They are called. So we get words like ecclesiastical, e e or in Spanish, iglesia. Um, um, which means a gathering, people who are called forth, brought together, whether you're in the city or the country, everyone comes together to the same place. The memoirs of the apostles and the writings of the, of the prophets. I mean, memoirs, think of that. Uh, 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 he doesn't use the word gospels, but we have what the saints have written and, um, and the prophets. They're reading the stuff from the Old Testament as well. As long as time permits, <laughs> which used to be a lot longer than 60 minutes, I guarantee you that. The one presiding, we would call that person a priest today, verbally instructs and exhorts a homily. Uh, we all rise together, a common actions. We, we all do things together. It's not like, okay, you know, stand and sit and kneel and do things as you wish. We do things together, we pray together, uh, bring bread and wine. There's an offertory. Uh, the president in like manner offers prayers and thanksgivings. How do you say thanksgiving in Greek? Eucharist. But well, we're at the Eucharistic prayer, thanksgiving. Now notice also what it says here, according to his ability. At this point, there is not a fixed 
Eucharistic prayer where, okay, I'm going to choose one, two, three, or four, or any of the others. No, that comes, I promise you, way later. But this is a time in which we give thanks to God, and to the best of his ability, he is going to offer these prayers, and the people say, amen, so be it. There's a distribution. Again, and those who are absent, the deacons are going to go, and, um, and we still do this today. The deacons and other lay um, ecclesial ministers who take Holy Communion to those who weren't present. So here we are in the second century. One of the things that I want you to hopefully walk away today with is the, the sense that, that the Council of Trent did not formulate a brand spanking new uh, mass as a result of Martin Luther and others having some protest. In fact, uh, I'll speak to you a little bit about what Martin Luther himself says about the Mass and the, and the parts in which he, he kept. I, I just use this as a really good point of departure because it, it really, um, um, well, it, it explains very well um, where we were at, at early, early, early on in the church. What we don't get to see too much of is what took place in the third and fourth centuries. But what comes out at about the end of the fourth, beginning of the fifth century, is very much the same. So though we're not hearing much about what is taking place in the context of, of, the, of what we now call the Mass, all of a sudden, the beginning of the fifth century, we have Pope Innocent I, who now is writing a letter to a friend of his who just kind of, the, the, the Pope is now just starting to mention a lot of the things that are taking place. It's like he's speaking in passing about some of the things. So we're, Pope Innocent uh, was Pope from 401 to 417. Um, so he, he speaks about um, um, that the kiss of peace, the sign of peace, has been moved from the beginning of the Mass of the Faithful to after the consecration. All right. Which means that there was the, the kiss of peace, a sign of peace before, earlier in the Mass, but now it's after, um, after the prayer of consecration. Where is it today? Still after, right? Um, in other words, right before we say, I'm going to walk up to the altar and receive the body and blood of Christ, I need to be at peace with everyone. Before you go to the altar, if you have anything against your brother, leave everything at the altar, go be at peace, and then come back. Uh, Pope Innocent talks about uh, the, the different commemorations of the living and, and the dead being made in the canon. So at the 8 o'clock Mass, I, I did the, the Roman canon, uh, the, the Eucharistic prayer number one is what we would call it today. And there's that moment in which, uh, and, and let us pray um, for all who are living. And then there's that moment of silence. And all gathered here. And then the second part, let us pray for all who have died. We're calling to mind those who have just recently died or loved ones from the past. So he, he's speaking about this particular part uh, of, of the Mass. Um, and, okay, and it goes on. He's referring to so many of the things that, we're, that we just take for granted. Now, I, I mentioned at the very beginning of this uh, talk today, um, when I used the prayer, the collect, uh, from, base, it was like the year uh, 350. This is Pope Vigilius, who is the first one that we know who actually prayed that prayer. November 22nd, 537, I think it was, something like that. Um, and it was compiled in a sacramentary. So think about the big red book that Monsignor and I use at Mass. It's called the Roman Missal. Why is it called the Missal? The altar servers love the, to be missile bearers, and they even speak in the sacristy of being missile launchers. Um, it's like, it's a different missal. Um, so the so missal, you hear the word misa, Misa in Latin means mass. So it's, it's the Roman mass is what, what they're, everything that deals with the Roman mass, Misa 
then the word mass etymologically means mission. Misa, you have a, a mission, you have a, you're commissioned. So when mass is over, in, in a real sense, mass is not over. You know, go. Your mass has really begun. The worship may be over, but the service has begun. So, um, so the, the Roman Missal, um, and you may recall before the, the change, remember with all the, the, the different verbiage that we use in the context of mass, the new translation, the, the new Missal that we have is actually from the year 2002. It just took so long for the English translation to be approved. The Mass was actually approved in Latin um, in 2002. Um, but, but if we go all the way back, it, even before that, we have what we used to call the sacramentary. And the sacramentaries <coughs> date back now to this time period that we're in, to the 5th, 7th centuries. And we have books that could be, uh, I would love to have these books. Um, these ancient sacramentaries and they have the compilation of all the prayers and what to do and when to use incense and when the servers need to move over here and so it, it's very much the same as what we have today and if you were to read through that and read through what we have even to this day you would see an unbelievable amount of, of similarity Oh, I'd love to talk more about these missiles, these sacramentaries. Let's just jump forward. Here, I need to get to this other page. Okay. So, I, I think you can follow along easily enough. 33, Lord's Supper, all the way to uh, the new uh, missile, the new mass. And... Uh, so things that would have been a widespread practice or optional uh, or universal norm of the Latin rite or part of another section of Mass or in a different location than, than it currently is. And by the way, th this goes all the way, I mean, through every element of the Mass. In fact, if you're interested in this, this is a really neat website. So the introit, the psalms sung as a processional. That's why we do at the cathedral what we do. The very first thing you hear is a chant of, of a, a part of a psalm. It's in the Roman Missal. What, what we've decided to do here several years ago is not just to choose a hymn from uh, someone else's selection. We're, we're, we're chanting the actual psalm that the church has, has given us. It's in the Roman Missal. We're going back to the beginning, a psalm as a processional. And all the way through, it's only in 1969 that uh, the, the option to have a, uh, a hymn is put into place. So people ask me at times, why are we doing this antiphonal type thing? I, I should have this on my iPhone ready to show them. Um, <laughs> The prayers at the foot of the altar, you know those prayers that, that if you go to the uh, traditional Latin mass, the priest stops before he enters to, uh, the mass hasn't begun yet, but he's uh, uh, preparing himself for the beginning of mass. And it just goes through the whole thing. But you saw all the yellow there. That, that's what I really wanted you to see. Uh, in other words, all of those things that have been the universal norm of the, uh, of the church. for the context of, uh, of the Mass. It's, it's remained so, so much the same down. Um, that there, yes, there have been nuances, obviously. It was Pope Gregory, as in Gregorian chant, uh, who, he really didn't change much of the Mass at all. Not at all. Uh, in fact, he could probably, um, be said to be the, the one who really kind of put the last touches on the Mass. Uh, he, he died in the year 604. So, not all the way back to the beginning, but pretty early on. Even Pope Benedict XIV, 
He said, no pope has added to or changed the canon, so the Eucharistic prayer, since Gregory, since uh, St. Gregory. Which, oh, so, okay, yeah, hello. Uh, pope Benedict XIV is 1740 until 1758, so right before the Revolutionary War. In other words, Trent is long past. Martin Luther is long past. And... And the doctrines, the dogmas, the uh, elements um, that we find in the context of Mass are so substantially the, the, the same. The Nicene Creed is, is one of the exceptions to the rule. It was only added uh, to the Mass in, in the 11th century. We've had it since the 4th century, but th there was no need to really kind of publicly profess it. It had been... Uh, used in many different parts of the uh, Christian world, uh, but it wasn't uh, until then that now everyone used it all the way up until today. Now, now we finally get to uh, the Council of Trent, the Tridentine Mass. So, yeah, the Protestant reformers wreaked havoc on the Mass. One of the main ways is by means of what they said regarding the Eucharist. Uh, Cheryl already talked about how it was no longer, well, by Zwingli at least, not referred to as the real presence of the Lord and the Blessed Sacrament, but the real absence. Um, not transubstantiation, but a, a new way of thinking, a consubstantiation. So transubstantiation means if you have something and the substance of it changes and it becomes something else. Bread becomes the, the body of Christ. Why? Because the Lord said so. He did it. He willed it so. Wine becomes uh, the blood of Christ. If I take this metal uh, microphone stand and put it in a in a hot fire for a long, long, long time and hand it to you and say, hey, please, uh, go ahead and take it. You know, no one here is going to grab it and say, okay, sure, Father, I'll move it for you. You know? Why? Well, as it were, the fire is inside of this, uh, of this metal rod. This is what we would call consubstantiation. That the metal rod hasn't changed, but there's something that is now inside of it. It's different. And and once, you know, if you wait enough time, the fire's going to go, and now you can go ahead and pick it up and, and move it again. So, consubstantiation would be, okay, the Lord is somehow present in the bread, which still remains bread, and then after the service is over, the, the, the fire has, has left, as it were, and, and that bread can now be placed back up on, in the sacristy um, cabinet uh, to be used and, as it were, re-consecrated um, uh, for use at another point. Uh, th th there's so much. So what I would like to do right now is to read to you from a Lutheran minister who is writing in March of 2017. All right? <laughs> Let's not hear what I think the Lutherans themselves say Martin Luther did regarding the Mass. Let's hear from, um, from a Lutheran minister himself. <clears throat> Luther didn't write much on worship per se. You know, c compared to the extensive writing uh, that Luther did on other topics, he didn't write a whole bunch on worship. Worship, I mean, at least in the narrow sense of what is taking place on uh, Sunday morning. But Luther wrote general guidelines, very much in like a paragraph form, often with general suggestions and options left open. For example, at one point, Luther writes, we accept the Kyrie. The Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. We accept the Kyrie eleison, which has been used up until now with the various melodies for different seasons together with the angelic hymn. What is the angelic hymn? The Gloria. 
that those are the words of the angels. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to people of goodwill. That those are the angels saying that at Jesus' birth. However, the bishop may decide to omit the to omit the latter as often as he wishes, and he explains how, uh, according to uh, the, the time and place, um, uh, there can be uh, so much more open to variation. Excuse me. Uh, for Luther, the sermon was the central focus of the service. In Luther's mind, and I'm reading this, uh, this uh, Lutheran uh, minister, in Luther's mind, the reason why a, ca a congregation gathered was to hear the preaching of God's word. Luther wrote, a Christian congregation should never gather together without the preaching of God's word and prayer, no matter how briefly. When God's word is not preached, one had better neither sing nor read or even come together. So, I mean, in one sense, we could say the same, you know. You know, we want to hear the word of God, sacred scripture, divine revelation. Um, but Luther's primary concern, going back to this author, was the proclamation of the gospel, and all the other liturgical rites and practices were secondary. That, that, that's something that, that, that's hard um, for, should be hard for us to, um, to hear. He often advocated cutting back on the psalms and prayers and give more time and attention to the preaching. Luther strongly opposed the sacrificial aspect of the Mass. At the core of Luther's teaching on the Lord's Supper, uh, at the core of Luther's teaching on the Lord's Supper was that it is a free gift given to us by God and not a good work done to earn God's favor. I, I don't think anyone here, at least please, um, no one here should think in terms of our doing what we do at Mass as if a good work done to earn God's favor. We're, we're there to worship. We're there to praise. We're, it, um, Luther supported stripping away the prayers that were added to the words of institution known as the canon of the Mass. Luther refers to this canon as Luther's words, that abominable concoction drawn from everyone's sewer and cesspool. Well, this was his understanding of, of what the canon of the Mass had become. That people just added to it whatever they wanted, and, and you hear the reference there. Um, and, and Luther, the theologian, the um, authority, that he was, was able to change the, the 1,500 years worth of, uh, of understanding of, of the Mass. Luther did not want to get legalistic about the order of service. Luther recognized that liturgical forms changed over time based on the setting and the needs of the community. I think we can all agree with that. He states, Liberty must prevail in these matters, and Christians must not be bound by laws and ordinances. I don't know that we can agree with that. Luther encouraged Christian freedom. Uh, again, as far as possible, we should observe the same rites and ceremonies, as far as possible, just as all Christians have one baptism, great, and the one and the same sacrament, and no one has received a special one from his own. Let me try reading it again. As far as possible, we should observe the same rites and ceremonies, just as all Christians have the same baptism and the same sacrament, and no one has received a special one of his own from God. He goes on to explain how it is that many people uh, 
how he and others thought that people, including some of the church fathers, thought that they had received, as it were, some um, divine revelation on what should be taking place in the context of Mass, and this was one of the things that he wanted to strip away. Um, and if anyone wants uh, this resource information, I'd be happy to uh, pass it on to you. So, again, the goal at the time of, of the Council of Trent is not to make a new missile, it's to restore the existing one according to the custom and right of the Holy Fathers, using for that purpose the best manuscripts and other documents that they had, uh, had gathered from the beginning. There was no Roman missal in place that had been put together by a council of the church. This is the first, the very, very first. So the Council of Trent put together this particular missile. Has there ever been another missile that has come out of a council? You're hesitating because you know it's a trick question. No. A lot of people say that the, the mass as we have it today uh, is a product of the Second Vatican Council. It's not a product per se of the Second Vatican Council. Cheryl spoke about how it took um, the three sessions over 18 years and five popes. Well, the Second Vatican Council, well, it was over two pontificates, John the 23rd, Paul the 6th. There were four sessions over four years. Um, and if you read the document on the, on the Mass itself, um, it, it, it does not outline for you the Mass that we have today. There was a committee that was, that was put together that Paul VI, Pope Paul VI put together in the aftermath of the Second Vatican Council that gave us the, uh, what is referred to as the 1969 um, right there, 1969. Sometimes you see it as 1970 because that's when it was actually put into place. Um, um, new order of the mass. 